How we doing, my people? It's your boy, C Rock LD, Prison Mentality, repping the real. Uh, today we have a very special guest, a honored guest, a man of respect, a man of honor. Uh, he's definitely an ex felon like me and a lot of people watching this video. And uh, he's definitely a success story, what we like to call a success story. As I said, he was an ex-felon. He was also addicted to drugs for many years. Somehow he came out of prison, reinvented himself. That's the key word, to reinvent yourself. Everything is a mindset, no matter who you are or what you're doing. If you want to change yourself, the first thing you have to change is your mindset, the way you think. The difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is their mindset, the way they think, the ideas that they come up with, and most importantly, executing those moves. So his name is Rick Duval. He's a good friend of mine. How you doing, Rick? What's up, brother? Glad and uh, here, let him talk to you about prison mentality. Here we go. How you guys doing, man? Doing good, Rick. It's an honor to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for letting me be here. And, um, you know, you have any questions you want to ask me? Sure, but we would like to know. Uh, I'm an open book. When did you go to prison and how much time did you do? So, uh, you know, I was, uh, I, I started using drugs in, in the late 80s. And, um, I, you know, I came from a broken home like a lot of us. My father had 16 kids by five different women. And uh, he, was never, he was never in my life. And uh, that was a great source of my pain. Okay. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I went to high school. I was playing football. I was very athletic. And when we got to high school, uh, I started hanging with the wrong crowd. You know, that, that peer pressure. I started smoking weed and, you know, drinking. That's it. how it starts with the weed. All them people that think that weed just because it's illegal and it, that's the, the the open gate. We start with weed and eventually graduate to all types of other stuff. And, and that's that's a true statement because that's what happened to me and. You know, eventually I, I, I graduated to the heart of drugs and started using heroin and cocaine and, you know, drinking. And, uh, you know, my, my 20s was pretty much a blur. And, uh, you know, I, was, I went from job to job. I couldn't hold a job. I was a thief. I stole anything. I stole anything that wasn't uh, uh, 10 pounds. So how long were you addicted for, would you say, before you went to prison? Probably about, uh, I started using when I was like 14 and... Uh, started going to prison when I was about 27 and you know I'd catch these little bids and I'd need six months and they'd let me go or I'd go to a drug program and you know to get out of going to prison you know the game that we play and uh you, you know Charlie for me the whole thing was was when I was out there you know, I, I was in a lot of pain you know and, and, and my father not being in my life was a lot of that you know so I was I was very angry very resentful um, I had a lot of trauma growing up, growing up, physical violence, uh, mental abuse, sexual abuse. Uh, and so it, it was just, uh, I was a kid that didn't get that nurturing and that All love. that played a factor yeah. in your drug addiction. Yeah. And of course, in the choices you made that sent you to prison. Yeah. And, and you know, the, I started committing crimes. I started robbing and stealing and, you know, burglaries and robberies and just living that, above. living that lifestyle. Um, and I understand today it was all to, to avoid pain. I was in a lot of pain, and I used drugs and alcohol to, 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 to help deal with that pain because I, I didn't know any other way, you know. And so uh, when I was 30 years old, um, I had about 200 charges. I had like five different courts I had to go to. I had warrants everywhere. Finally, they, they locked me up, and, and I wasn't getting out. So you got locked up then. How much time did you do? I was sentenced to five years, um, and a lot of stuff was running concurrent. So I probably could have got 20 years, but they ran five and five and three. They all ran them all concurrent. Yeah. Um, and I had everything go to one court. But then when I got there, when I got to jail, more warrants came up, and there was this one court that didn't want me to, didn't want it, um, uh, sentenced me to con concurrent time. They wanted to sentence me to consecutive time, so they gave me six months consecutive. So at that time, uh, you know, they were letting people go pretty early, 10, 20 percent. 
But because I had the extra six months, I had to do 50% of the five and a half years. And so I ended up getting parole. And you know, why I was in jail, you know, I did all the programs and I really wanted to change and I didn't want to live that way. And so, um, so would it be fair to say you actually started reinventing yourself and changing your mindset while in prison? Yes. Yes. Okay. I started a lot of people aren't aware of that. Not everybody in prison is a bad guy, man. We just get caught up in certain circumstances and factors that be, but granted, some people definitely deserve to be in prison. But the majority of the people just get caught up in whether a drug habit or a product of the environment or just circumstances. But I can honestly say I met more good people loyal, honest people in prison than I did on the streets. But, uh, yeah, so Rick came home. And, uh, Rick, talk to us how, uh, once you came home, how you started surrounding yourself with good people. What type of good people was you surrounding yourself with? Well, I came home, I, I paroled to a halfway house. And, uh, you know, I, I started going to 12-step meetings. Um, I surrounded myself with people that were, were clean and sober. Um, I... You know, got a job. I started working hard. I, I went from one job to another job to another job. And you cut off all the negativity. I there was cut, no negativity at this time. I cut off all the negativity, all the negative people. And um, and then I got back in the union. I had a really good union job. Great, great. And, uh, you know, one of the things about me, Charlie, is I'm an entrepreneur. Like, I, I, like, I, like, to, I like to build stuff. One of the things I've always done is build businesses. And so I, I'm a contractor by... By trade, I'm a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty talented guy. And um, you know, one thing, one thing that my father did give me was a hard work ethic. He didn't teach it to me, but just some, for some reason, I had a hard work ethic. Maybe it was my mom. My mom was single growing up, us growing up, and she always worked hard to put a roof over our head. And so I started a business. I started a construction business, and I and I became successful pretty fast. I bought I bought a couple houses. And, and I had this dream, I was gonna turn one of the houses into a sober house, um, but it didn't happen. And all those things that I was doing, all those positive things and all those positive people I had around me, I stopped doing those things. Wow. I stopped doing those things because I had my life, I had been elevated to a whole nother level. I, I had the success that I never thought I could you have. You became too comfortable, would that be a fair statement? You just very, got relaxed yeah. at the point in life that you were with the successful business. Very, very complacent. Not using complacent, that's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, I, I started I started drinking again. I was, I was dating a woman that I should have, she was, a, she was a stripper at this bar, beautiful Brazilian girl. And, um, I started drinking again, and she knew I didn't drink. And she knew what, you know, I had been clean for like seven years. And we were, we were at Coney Island one day in New York. We were at the beach, and then we went to this bar to eat some food. And the people I was hanging out with were drinking. And I just ordered a drink, and I was off and running again. And it was, um, you know, back to, back to my old ways. Hold on. So you came out of prison. You built a successful business in construction. Yep. You bought a couple of homes. Yep. And you lost it all again. No, I didn't lose anything, Charlie. I gave it away. Oh, you gave it away. I, oh, okay. You know, my drug of choice was, was crack. Okay. And then, and then uh, crack and heroin and any drug that was put in my face. Because you got to realize, bro, I was still in a lot of pain. On pain that I never dealt with. So it was untreated pain. It was untreated trauma. You know, those seven years, I was focused on women, building a business. I was focused on, on, on looking successful. You know, that was the thing. If you gave me a pat on the back, like my family was so proud of me doing so well, but on the inside, was hurt. My, my soul was screaming. I was in so much pain and I, I, I lived in fear and I, you know, I didn't trust anybody. So would it be fair to say that just because you became successful and financially stable and lived a great lifestyle, and even though you were surrounded by positive people, your mindset or your whatever we want to call it, wasn't right, huh? It wasn't right. You were still dealing with demons that you didn't, uh, yeah. wasn't the way you never, had. Never dealt with. Uh, you know, so I started drinking again and living that lifestyle again and getting back in with those wrong people. And I always like to say this, this metaphor that uh, everything good in my life 
went in that crack pipe. The business, the houses, the relationships, myself went in that crack pipe and I started smoking crack again. And my life went downhill. And uh, don't tell me you went back into prison. I, I did a couple, I did a couple small bids. I got a few, I bought a few cases, you know, and, uh, you know, but there was a part of me inside knew that I could be successful. You know, I had a little bit of hope, a little bit of faith that I could have that life again. But when you're back in it, it's hard to get out of it, you know, and, and not it's a lifestyle, right? You know, it's a yes, lifestyle. And, and you become addicted to the lifestyle, but all that un, untreated pain went with me. Wherever I went, it all went with me. It, 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 wherever I go, it, it was with me. It was there. And okay, so you went back to prison. Tell us about that. How much I, I went, did you I do? went back. I went. I went back to jail. The longest I did was forty-five days. Okay. And then they put me in a drug program. And um, you know, during during those seven years that I that I was back in it, you know, I was in and out of rehab. I would get clean for a month or two, and and then I'd be right back at it. You know what I mean? And, and along that way, I went to prison. Uh, I think it was 2005. I went back to prison for like 45 days in Fort County Jail. And uh, and then I went through a program. And uh, I ended up getting kicked out of that program. And there was a girl involved. I had, I was using with the woman again. Guys, we got to keep it real with the women, man. Yeah. We got to be very careful with the women. You know, in my belief, if you're on a certain level... That doesn't mean you're better than anybody else. It just means you're on a different level. So if you're on a level that you're trying to better yourself, you're trying to reinvent yourself and become successful and just live a positive life, we have to be very careful of not only the people that we keep around us, but the women that we choose to be in relationships with. Like Rick said, this is the second time that a woman, you know, of course it was his fault. He, you know, we're not going to blame it on the woman. But she did play a factor in it. So, Rick, so you came out. Let's talk about how you reinvented yourself the second time. So, what had happened was um, I got back with this woman, and we, we were using together. And then uh, I got my life back together. I had about 10 months clean, and I, I moved into a recovery house, and I was doing well, and I got this job. I was working as a sign salesman. I was selling signs for this sign company, oh, a national sign company, and um, I was very good at it. I bought myself a new car. I was I was reinventing myself, um, but but there was still that untreated trauma, you know. But I, I will say this: I started doing a little bit of therapy. I started, you know, talking about what was going on, and um, I hadn't. Would seen you say that therapy is very important when someone's very trying important. to change it's their a, life it's a, around? It's a purge of your soul. Uh, you know, I've learned that talking and writing are two very powerful tools that we could use to help us purge our soul, to get that, to get that, that stuff that, that we hold inside that carries all that pain to get it out. Uh, so I was with this, I was clean 10 months. I, 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 I thought that I had to have this woman in my life and I went and found her. Okay. And, uh, you know, she was in a hotel. And uh, she was smoking crack, and I said, listen, um, I'm, I'm rebuilding this life. I want you to come, you know, move. I want you to come live with me. You was inviting her into your I, new world. I was inviting her into my new world, and, and she said, well, if you give me drugs, I'll go with you. And I bought some drugs, some crack. We ended up smoking crack all night. But the next morning, we packed up from that hotel, and I went back down to where I was living on the shoreline. And um, I found us a place to live. I had saved some money, and I was working. Um so I found us a nice place, and we had this beautiful apartment on a lake. It was an in-law apartment on a lake. A couple weeks goes by, and, and, and she was really working hard at staying clean, and I was working hard at staying clean. We were still, you know, dabbling a little bit. Dipping and dabbling. The there weekend days, warrior. The weekend warrior. There were <laughs> days that we were staying clean, and then we both got into intensive outpatient, which is IOP, and we started doing it together. And then there was an event that happened. Changed that changed our lives. She got pregnant, and she was going to have a baby. And and and, it, and, it, and I don't know. It was kind of like an awakening for both of us because it was a defining moment. I never had I never had kids before, and I'm like I'm like 42 years old. I had never been a father. I always wanted to be a father, and um, you know I, I was with the woman that I loved, and um, you know she was working to stay clean. I was doing the same thing. We lived in this beautiful spot. 
and we were going to we were going to change our lives and continue to do therapy and IOP and things started getting a little bit better and about a month went by and she had an ectopic pregnancy she lost a baby wow so you hear that yeah and so uh at that moment she took off we separated and uh you know, it was February 4th, 2008. I was by myself, we had taken off. And uh, so, Rick, let me get, let's get into the today. You're, you're a successful well, there, was, there was a defining moment. Oh, that. I'm sorry. February yeah, 4th, yeah. 2008 uh, was the last the last time I used it. February and what? February 4th, 2008 was the last time I used it. 2008, I had, huh? I had gotten a bunch of drugs and uh, the plan I was going to kill myself. I had got a bunch of crack, a bunch got of heroin. That serious, Rick? Well, that's how I felt at that okay. time. Okay. I mean, all those years, Charlie, using, that's how I felt. I think, I think a lot of a lot of people that are addicted to drugs feel the same way. Okay. You know, we feel like suicide is an option, but I was never, I guess I never had the courage to uh, actually do it. And so... Thank God for that. Um, I remember I got the drugs, and I, I was getting high, and I, and I didn't I didn't follow through with the, with the suicide, and... Um, I remember uh, it was like about one o'clock in the morning, and, and all the drugs were gone, and I was sitting in this apartment by myself. And I said, uh, "God, I don't want." I got on my knees and I prayed. I said, "God, I don't want to live this way anymore." And uh, I went to sleep. And, uh, and I woke up the next morning. It was about six thirty, and I called this guy that was in the program, um, and, I, and, I, and I, I said to him, "I said, um, yeah, I need help. I'm ready." He reached out. Me up. He reached out. Yep. He picked me up and he brought me to a meeting. And then from there, I said, what, what do I do? He said, you're going to move into a sober house, a recovery house. And uh, he gave you a floor plan. He, he, he paid my week for it. He paid my rent for a couple weeks. I had to go out and find a job. And uh, that was the last time I used, February 5th, 2008. Guys, real the quick on suicide. Suicide is never an option. No matter how bad you're talking, this is Charlie Rock LD talking. I've done up to 18 months of solitary confinement. That's the most time I did. And you're never in your lowest point as when you're in solitary confinement. And um, suicide is never, ever an option. No matter what you're going through, no matter how dark the moment is, tomorrow is always a brighter day. So please, don't ever contemplate don't ever think about suicide. Suicide is not an option. So, Rick, today you're a successful man. You own a bunch of sober houses. Let's recovery talk about houses. recovery houses. My bad. Recovery houses, redemption house. Uh, let's talk about your houses and what do they do? What they do today? So uh, we started. We started our, our. We opened our first house uh, in 2000, uh, 2014. Okay. Um, it was it was an eight man house. Um, I was working again as a contractor. I started a successful uh, contracting business, very lucrative. I was doing well for myself. Hey. Um, I had met a woman <coughs> who's my wife today. Um, her and I got married. I went back to school to become a drug and alcohol counselor, uh, which I ended up graduating. I did get my uh, degree in drug and alcohol counseling. Yeah. And. Uh, when I was in, when I was doing my internship, I, I kind of figured out that I didn't really want to be a drug and alcohol counselor at a program because of, uh, I didn't agree with with a lot of uh, uh, how should I say? It? I didn't like how they did things. You know okay. what I mean? And, and, and like you I said, you didn't agree with the program. Yes, yes. And and, and, and like I said earlier, I had this entrepreneur spirit, and so. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do at that time, and my wife encouraged me. She said, "Just finish school, and, and you'll figure it out." And so, uh, a funny thing happened. It was one of the greatest things that ever happened to me. The day before my wedding, my wife tells me that she's pregnant. Wow! I was having my first son. A child can definitely do that, right, Rick? Yes. Bringing a new person into the world yep. can definitely have a major impact on your way of thinking and your outlook on life. No? Yes. Yes. And um, you know, I was at this at this time at this point in my life. I was about six years sober, clean and sober. And you know, the, the one thing I did that I didn't do that other time in my previous recovery, um, I didn't work on myself. I didn't deal with any of the, the trauma and the pain 
that, that I was holding inside. So the first time around, you were successful, you built a business, but as you just said, you didn't work on the inner demons, I, your yes. inner things that yes. the second time around, you figured it out. I, and I, yeah, you, I worked, did. you got therapy, yep. which let me say something about therapy. I'm Puerto Rican and we was raised with that hardcore machismo shit. And a lot of times we believe that when we take therapy, that we're crazy, that there's something wrong with us. That's that old way of thinking. Therapy is a good thing. Therapy is definitely a good thing.